time. Yeah. Uh, we have Dr. Vineet Ratra coming in as the next speaker, who's a senior consultant in cataract and glaucoma from Shankar Netralia, Chennai. And he's going to be talking on a case uh, discussing medical therapy in glaucoma. On to you, Dr. Vineet. Yes. So, well, thank you, madam, and thank you, AIOS. So, I'll be talking about uh, medical management, and let's start with this patient, a 54-year-old gentleman who presented with uh, blurring of vision in his left eye more since the last three months. He's a known patient of glaucoma since 14 months and was on prostaglandin analogs, a known diabetic who was allergic to sulfonamides. His best corrected visual acuity was 6-6-N6, six, six, six. his uh, extraocular movements were full, there was no RAPD, slit lamp was, uh, had no pseudo exfoliation, no pigments, and his intraocular pressures were 14 and 18 millimeters of mercury. His gonioscopy showed angle structures open till uh, scleral spur. So what are the management strategies? You need to identify the type and mechanism of glaucoma, which in this case was open angle. And you need to identify those at risk of severe uh, vision loss. So we need to ask certain uh, histories. Uh, so in, we need to ask for a family history of glaucoma, especially uh, in siblings. Uh, he had, he, it was negative for glaucoma. His father had uh, retinal detachment. Uh, there was no history of steroid usage, sleep apnea, ocular trauma, smoking, uh, no migraine, no history of any Raynaud's phenomenon. Uh, there was no history of him doing any yoga with headstands or uh, any excessive water drinking in the morning. Uh, he only was a regular voluntary blood donor where he gave blood every three to four months and for so many uh, years. Um, so some guidelines, uh, we need to establish a baseline IOP, if possible do three IOP readings at different times of the day. Always do a gonio and uh, if you are a uh, postgraduate who is learning, you can always uh, look at gonioscopy.org. Uh, do a disc evaluation, take a, a stereoscopic disc photo, do a visual field, uh, both a 24-2 or a 30-2 and a 10-2, assess the structural loss and uh, to set the target intraocular pressure, you need to classify the glaucoma as mild, moderate uh, and severe. So we called our patient and three days later he came and we called him in the morning and his intraocular pressure was uh, 18 and 28 millimeters of mercury and he had used his uh, medications the night before. His pachymetry was uh, 570 and 572, and this is what his uh, discs looked like. So in the right eye, there was a slight inferior thinning, which was more prominent in the left eye. And you can also see the retinal nerve fiber loss, which you can see more prominently in the red-green uh, photos. So his fundus, his uh, Humphrey visual field of the right eye was normal, and in the left eye, there was a superior uh, defect, which was threatening uh, fixation. The OCT did show thinning in both eyes, uh, though within normal, there was some amount of thinning even in the right eye, both superior uh, and, and inferior, and more thinning in the left eye, which can be seen even in this uh, pie chart. The GCC again showed thinning uh, inferiorly in the right eye and inferiorly and superiorly uh, in the left eye. So uh, we then need to classify the glaucomatous damage as mild, moderate and severe, which helps us to determine the target intraocular pressure, uh, target intraocular pressure for the individual. So what is target intraocular pressure? Well, it's the upper limit or a range of IOP, which is judged to be compatible with the treatment goal, which will uh, slow the rate of visual field deterioration to maintain the patient's quality of life. So if you have uh, early glaucomatous damage with short life expectancy, high untreated uh, intraocular pressures and no additional risk factors with slow rate of progression, one can have higher target intraocular pressures, but one needs to reassess them time and again. So well in our patient, uh, we did set target intraocular pressures of high teens in the right eye and uh, mid to low teens uh, in the left eye. Uh, so, which medications would one generally use uh, as the first line, second line or third line medication? Well, uh, this depends on both the patient's characteristics and the drug properties. So, uh, it depends on both the systemic and ocular uh, safety profile, the adherence and compliance of the patient and whether he's willing to use it uh, multiple times of the day and also the efficacy of the drug as to what the target intraocular pressure is and what the cost of the medicine would be. 
one could use drugs that decrease aqueous humor production, drugs that increase aqueous humor outflow, or drugs which do both. And one could choose among any one of these which have different mechanisms of actions and different uh, side effects. And this patient of ours was already on prostaglandin analogs. Uh, so then uh, the target intraocular pressure was not reached. So what is our second option? So uh, one option is to add a second drug or to consider laser uh, trabeculoplasty. Well, if you're adding a second drug, do we switch or do we add? So well, uh, uh, if you were having a 15% fall in uh, intraocular pressure uh, with the first medication, then it makes sense to add a second uh, drug. And if you're actually having to switch drugs, one needs to remember about the washout of the drugs. So most of our patients, uh, or nearly 40% of the patients, require two or uh, more medications to maintain sufficient reductions in IOP. And it's over here that combined uh, agents uh, are better because they are uh, provide uh, better compliance uh, since there's reduced exposure to preservatives and there's no possibility of washout effect of the second medicine. It's important to uh, see that the patient is compliant or, or adherent. There can be various reasons why they do it. So one needs to communicate with the patients, ask them open-ended questions, always ask them how their vision is, uh, especially as compared to their last visit. Ask them if they are using medications regularly. One could ask them if they forget medicine, did they do so in the last week? Are they having any problems with their current medic medications? Always simply simplify the regimen. Uh, say I tell my patients to use, they all have mobile phones, tell them to set alarms on it or do them uh, adjust their dosage along with uh, daily routines like breakfast and uh, dinner. Uh, one needs to take care of uh, one major cause of uh, compliance uh, being poor is ocular surface. One needs to look at the eyelid margins, so, uh, look at the fluorescein staining, both the corneal and the conjunctiva and look at the tear breakup uh, time. Uh, preservatives, the BAK can uh, affect the corneal epithelium and the uh, conjunctiva. It can cause subconjunctival fibrosis with loss of goblet cells, which can negatively affect the long-term uh, success rate of glaucoma filtration surgeries. So, well, to get back to our original patient, uh, we added netrosudil uh, in his uh, left eye since we had a target which was mid to low teens. Um, this is the rokinase inhibitor. Uh, on his, minute remaining. Yeah, on his last visit, his intraocular pressure was uh, 15 millimeters of mercury with latinoprost in both eyes and a netrosudal uh, uh, 7 p.m. in his left eye. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Vineet. Uh, thanks a lot. I have a question to Dr. Vinay Nangya in this. Um, are beta blockers always a no-no in all cases of uh, in cardiac uh, ailments? or is it specific to certain disease conditions? Dr. Vinay? He's not there. I, I mean, uh, if, yes. uh, you know, there is a uh, known bradycardia or there's, a, there's a, a, a previous history of cardiac block or a pacemaker has been put in, you know, those are the times when, uh, you know, we would be a little bit hesitant with using uh, uh, beta blockers, but, uh, uh, otherwise, um, you know, uh, of course, asthma is one thing and depression. Uh, these are other things that I would keep in mind if I were to use beta blockers. And uh, Dr. Vinay, uh, Vine, when uh, would you uh, think of uh, uh, when a patient is already on systemic beta blockers in those patients? Actually, there's been a lot of debate on this. I think the best thing is that if beta blocker is indicated, you always have an option of not using beta blockers because there are so many other medications. But if you are strongly inclined towards beta blockers, then please use beta blockers, see whether it's causing, it has a pressure reducing efficacy and then take a decision on whether it's all right to be using it actually. Uh, Dr. Vineet, I'm going to ask you a question. What is the percentage of failures with the use of ROC inhibitors? Question number one, when would you consider removing these ROC inhibitors a few days prior to TRAB surgery? And would you consider reusing it if the IOP is high in the immediate post-operative period? You so need to The uh, rokinase uh, inhibitors do cause uh, congestion. Uh, there is congestion, there is hyperemia, but that's more because of the mechanism of action uh, of the drug. 
that it causes vasodilatation and thus that. So cosmetically, uh, if you tell the patient that yes, there is congestion, but there is a good uh, fall in pressure, these are good drugs. Uh, they do reduce uh, scarring, so I don't stop them uh, preoperatively, and I would use them as uh, my uh, now in po in glaucoma patients, uh, in patients whom I've had cataract surgery, I do use uh, uh, rokinase inhibitors as my uh, good first line drug. Telling the patient that yes, your eye may look a little more red, don't get worried, but if it worsens, come back and show me. Postoperatively, they reduce scarring. So yeah. actually, they would be good drugs to use in glaucoma surgery if your pressures are high postoperatively. Oh, great. So that, I think, answered uh, all my questions. Dr. Shailesh? Uh, and Dr. Vinisa nicely covered, although it's a very vast topic to cover in a few short time. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, when there are no contraindication, which will be your first line of therapy? Many times, I mean, the questions are aimed at postgraduates also or the beginners. Second part is, do you think of monocular trial or uh, you directly go ahead with the bilateral? Yeah, so that uh, as of now, prostaglandines are my um, first line of drugs, especially if cost is not an issue. But now most of the drugs uh, have come down with uh, costs which are uh, low. So uh, prostaglandines do come up as my first choice. Uh, sorry about the second question. Uh, Monocular trial, like oh, yes, definitely. So it again depends on uh, the amount of damage. So if the damage is uh, severe, if it's an advanced glaucoma with a lot of damage, then I wouldn't want to uh, do a monocular trial uh, because I would want pressures in both eyes to come down. But if it is one which is mild to moderate, then yes, I would prefer to do a monocular trial to see how much of uh, fall in pressure is in the worst side. Uh, and then uh, decide on the other eye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we are running.